Good morning. How many of you recognize this? Has anyone in here ever solved one of these? Half of you are lying right now. When I was a kid, there were far, far bigger problems in the world, but the biggest problem I had was this complex little device. There was nothing in the world more complicated to me than this. I've still never solved it. But what it demonstrates to me now is that there are simple solutions to complex problems like that. I just missed it. <laughs> I should have paid more attention in art class. I could have solved this problem 30 years ago. But what this image demonstrates is that there are simple solutions to even complex problems. But sometimes we just miss them. Complex problems, let's talk about one complex problem that we're all familiar with. Healthcare in the United States. Ooh. We've been talking a lot about it. There are very few problems in our culture that are more complicated, made even more complicated by a number of factors. People are getting older. The baby boomers are coming. The hell are we going to do? I shouldn't have said hell. My nine-year-old is up there. <laughs> um, but this is a big problem. And another compounding factor is that fewer doctors, fewer nurses, we're going to have to care for more people with less resources. We've spent exorbitantly, largely on health care, over the last several decades. And after six years of the discussion, we're tired of this. I'm tired of this. We're tired of the debate. And yet even a problem as complex as this, there are simple solutions. It's pretty simple. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that this image is designed to make us uncomfortable. And we laugh because it's, it's a little uncomfortable. But if the problem that we are trying to solve is to deliver better care to more people for less money, then we need to embrace this. End of life care for the opportunity that it is. Now you're real uncomfortable. What prevents us from recognizing this as an opportunity is the very fabric of who we are. Our core American value system. What we hold dear. Let me explain. When I was nine years old, Rocky III came out. Rocky III was the greatest movie a nine-year-old boy has ever seen, ever. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone and Mr. T, an epic battle. It was awesome. Awesome. By the time the third movie came out, Sylvester Stallone and Rocky had become a mainstay of American pop culture. But what he had also become was a universally recognized emblem of our values. Fight to the end. Never give up. You can beat the odds. Get up, Rocky. Right? Another example of this value system that we hold so dear is in actually a real person. Diana Nyad, for those of you that don't recall, this 64-year-old woman last September swam 110 miles. She swam. What makes this all the more inspiring and improbable is not that she's 64. 
but that she had failed three times before. Don't give up. Never surrender. You can do it, Diana. In my lifetime, and in many of yours, there has been no more improbable image that represents these core values than what happened in Lake Placid in 1980. These guys weren't even a hockey team four months earlier. These are kids from all over the country playing for different schools. Herb Brooks grabbed them, threw them together, taught them to believe in themselves, fight to the end, never give up. You can beat the odds, and they did. They beat the Russians! <laughs> that was back when, you know, we didn't get along with the Russians. <laughs> the Russian Olympic hockey team had won six of seven Olympic gold medals in previous Olympics. They were Goliath on ice. I swear to God, they were nine and a half feet tall. And these kids beat them. Improbable as it was, they beat them. We celebrate events like this, images like this, because it speaks to our core identity. We like to think of ourselves as underdogs still, right? We celebrate stories of the underdog succeeding in the face of near insurmountable odds. Hell, I'm an entrepreneur. I have to believe in beating the odds. It doesn't look so good for me. But the fact of the matter is, we come by this honestly, right? There is no bigger underdog story than the American Revolution and what our forefathers learned then and have taught every American since is never give up, never surrender, fight to the end, and you can beat the odds. This approach has inarguably served us well. By every measure, we are a very successful country. But when you apply that approach, that approach to life's challenges, to the challenge of death, there's a cost. Nobody likes to talk about this. 32% of the money we spend in Medicare goes to serve patients in the last two years of their lives. This makes us uncomfortable. It's, it, it just it speaks to value in human life in terms of dollars, and that makes us squeamish. But we should be talking about this. And we should be talking about this. 80% of our chronically ill would prefer to avoid the hospital. How many of them do you think will succeed? Not very many. 70% of us in this room would prefer to die at home. We want to be surrounded by our friends, our families, looking at the pictures we hung on the wall, on the wallpaper we wish we would have changed two years ago. How many of us do you think will realize this dream? Not enough. This image makes us uncomfortable. But this should horrify us. We should be horrified by the way we die. By the cost, not in terms of dollars, but in terms of this, in terms of quality. In the relentless pursuit for just a little more time.
Life is a terminal disease. <laughs> Maddie, I don't know where you are. I know you didn't want this slide. I'm sorry. Um, John Cleese, the iconic British comedian who himself, I think, is nine and a half feet tall, he wrote a book called Life and How to Survive It. It's an important quote from that book. We as a culture, we've gotten our heads around the last half, right? We're managing that pretty well. It's the terminal part we're struggling with. At the end of our lives, our friends, our families, our doctors, we will go to extreme lengths, extreme measures, improbable measures, uncomfortable measures at the end of our lives. And it serves two masters, really. When you do that, when your loved one is dying and you're fighting to the end, you're showing loyalty to them. Or so we perceive. But we're also showing loyalty to these American ideals of never surrender, never give up. And there is a cost. NPR did a segment about two weeks ago. I'm a huge NPR addict. They did a segment on La Crosse, Wisconsin. Any of you hear this? Good, good. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, 96% of the population has a living will. 96% of the population of La Crosse has had an uncomfortable conversation about death, about the way they want to die. This is a community that has embraced this process so thoroughly, they're planning funeral buffet menus and playlists. A lot of Bruce Springsteen, no kidding. But we can learn two things from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Number one, when given the opportunity to choose for themselves at a time when they can make these decisions for themselves, the residents of La Crosse, Wisconsin chose less intensive care, not more, than is the norm. Less. No feeding tubes, no ventilators, no hospitals, no surgeries. Just let me the second thing that we learned from La Crosse, Wisconsin comes to us from the Dartmouth University Healthcare Atlas. Dartmouth University every year carves up the map into 306 distinct regions. And they measure these regions in terms of population and healthcare expense and outcomes. What we see in La Crosse is that the population and the outcomes are very similar to many, many other areas in the United States. But the cost is not. The cost is at the bottom. We spend less money in La Crosse, Wisconsin than anywhere else, and yet it doesn't compromise the quality of their outcomes. As you now know, my parents are in the audience here. We've had this discussion. We've had an uncomfortable discussion about death and how they want to die, and it was scary. It was uncomfortable. It was a little sad, but it was scary more than anything. Having had that discussion with my mom and dad, though, I now understand that I would have made very different decisions for them than they have now made. I would have done this. Fight to the end, Dad. Don't give up. We can beat this. We can beat the odds, Mom. That's what I would have done. But as it turns out, what my parents want, what many of us want, is La Crosse, Wisconsin. 
Just let me be. What Lacrosse Wisconsin proves is not that it is the solution to our overall healthcare problem. It is not the solution, but it is part of the solution. It is a very simple part of the solution to this problem. The problem of quality, of how we die. These achievements, they speak to who we are, they inspire us, and they should, they should. Events like this, accomplishments like this, they should inform how we live our lives. But this should not be where we go for guidance as to how we should manage our deaths. Thank you all very much.